Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I, don't know, I don't know. This is the first in the year of the Lathan and Watkins Forum. Um, I'm Eleanor Fox. I'm the faculty. I know a lot of you. It's good to see you all. Um, we have a really great cast of characters to speak about this really vital issue of big tech. And um, we have next to me is Chris Hughes. I'm going to introduce each one a little more in a moment. We have Chris Hughes next to me, Tad Lipsky, and Florencia uh, Marata Wergler. And let me just say a word about the subject matter, then I introduce them more formally, and then each of the panelists will talk for a short time. We'll have a little panel discussion. We're definitely reserving time for you to talk, ask questions, make observations. When that time comes, wait for a mic so we can all hear you and get it on tape. And then at the very end, we reserve 10 minutes for each of you to make a closing remark. So on the subject of the day, and it's really the subject of the world, big tech, there has been an avalanche um, regarding big tech. Uh, let's call the big tech GAFA, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. And those four com companies have huge amounts of data, uh, using it in various ways, which has been challenged. Uh, they've taken many actions that have been challenged in terms of squeezing out competitors or gobbling them all up, and even possibly going into banking. And so the claim is that these companies have gotten so big, they're bigger than countries, they're bigger than all of us, they have, the claim is they have a new kind of power, and we ought to be thinking about how to control the power, how to make them accountable. In the United States alone, we have investigations going on in the Federal Trade Commission, in the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, in Congress, and in the world, in fact, the United States is behind Europe, because in the world, uh, the Europeans have been investigating and even brought actions and imposed huge fines against some of the firms. Uh, the European Union imposed fines of more than $9 billion against Google alone. And also in the news just yesterday, uh, Europe is ramping up its investigation and account, calling to account big data um, with the head commissioner and head of competition is also in charge of digital economy for Europe. That's Margrethe Vesteyer. And uh, Europe has been much more proactive than the United States which we will be talking about how proactive should the United States be. Um, so this subject actually, as it will unfold even today, you'll see it's a wonderful laboratory for law. Are there new problems? Are there new problems that should be controlled by law? Should they be controlled by enforcement of the law? Or should Congress step in and have new legislation? Should there be regulation of data? What are the tools? What are the institutions to grab onto the new um, problems, if they are problems? And we will talk about that, too. So just yesterday, Matt Stoller had an article in The Guardian that said that, that is called, The Great Breakup of Big Tech is Finally Beginning. How many of you think so? Is the breakup of big tech finally beginning? Do you think we're going to get a big breakup of big tech? Raise your hands. How many of you think so? <laughs> Chris, you think so. One. <laughs> Two. There was a second. Okay. All right. So maybe you'll have a view on this. Maybe you already have a view and you're shy. Um, but maybe you have a better view at the end of the program. Let me introduce everybody pretty quickly. Um, Chris Hughes, I'm sure you know, he is a co-founder of Facebook. He was a roommate of Mark Zuckerberg. And among his many calls to fame, 
he wrote a really important article in the New York Times just this last May that said it's time to break up Facebook. Um, and much more to be said, including his book, Fair Shot, but I won't uh, pause on that because I want to go on. I'll introduce Tad Lipsky sitting next to Chris. Um, Tad was a partner at Latham and Watkins for a number of years. Um, before that, he had many um, uh, professional uh, tasks, including he was chief antitrust counsel for Coca-Cola, and including he was the chief deputy um, assistant antitrust attorney in the Justice Department, and he's also played a, an important role in the Federal Trade Commission, um, along with his m much work on international competition in general. And he is an adjunct professor at George Mason's Antonia Scalia, Antonin Scalia Law School. And next to him is my colleague Florencia Murata Wergler. And Florencia is an expert on consumer privacy, contracts, consumer law, electronic commerce, and does a huge amount on privacy and data. And uh, is a graduate of this law school and is the director of the NYU Study Abroad Program in Buenos Aires, for, for you who want to go to Buenos Aires. Uh, so I will turn, first I'm going to uh, turn to Chris um, for five or six minutes of what is the problem and what should we do in big tech. Chris. Well, thank you, Eleanor, for inviting all of us here and to all of you guys for coming out uh, on this uh, beautiful day. So um, I actually had the privilege, Eleanor, I didn't know if you were going to say how we met, but um, in the spring when I was working on uh, the antitrust piece that ended up getting published in the New York Times, I um, was trying to talk to pretty much every expert I could uh, to ensure that uh, a lot of the arguments that I were making were at least in the vein of scholarship and not totally off the wall. And um, I got a chance to meet uh, Professor Fox and uh, go through the, the, the bits and pieces of the, of the argument. And I don't know if you remember, but like once I finally got to where I am, you, you leaned in and you said, so you're going to call to break up the company into three parts? And I said, yeah, I think so. What do you think about that? And you were like, well, that will be big. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think so. Does that strike you as reasonable? Or And then yeah. this part, a little bit, this part, yeah. not. And then we got into yeah. a fun discussion about it. So, um, it which it's was so funny, but everybody talks about that today, and it's not even so unusual to think that today. As yeah. It actually was just a few months ago. Times have changed quickly. Yeah. So um, anyway, thank you for, for that conversation, for subsequent conversations, for inviting me here today, and for, for having us. Um, I want to talk about um, one particular event that's happened over the past few months and then try to put on the table at least the framework that I use to think about the intersection of anti-monopoly, antitrust, regulation, and uh, something that uh, I and some others call the public option. So as many of you know, in Facebook's case, um, the FTC leveled a, a truly historic fine this year of $5 billion on Facebook for its role in the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal. And um, when I and many other people saw that number come down, I was shocked. That was, uh, you know, the, the closest fine to that had been from the Europeans and had been a fraction of it. And uh, I was in a meeting in my office, which happens to be only a few blocks from here, and I opened up a new tab in the browser because they, it was announced by Facebook at 4.30 on an earnings call to look to see what was happening in the aftermarket trading. And um, you immediately saw the, the stock ticker turn green. And it ticked up and ticked up. And then I continued to watch it. This was before the piece came out, but I continued to watch it. And over the course of the following 24 hours, after one of the largest fines in American history had been announced by the Federal Trade Commission, Facebook had added $30 billion to its market capitalization, recouping the cost of that fine by six and sailing right on through. And I think this tells us a lot about the current moment that we're in. 
it tells us that Facebook is an enormous company, historically, uh, historically large, and it's not just Facebook. It's Google, it's Apple, it's Amazon, it's the others as well. It also tells us that regulators in Washington are waking up to the fact that this is a problem. And thirdly, it tells us that the frameworks that we have been using for the past few decades are not going to be sufficient to bring any true accountability for, uh, for folks who believe that there should be uh, uh, more competition in that space and a better uh, protection, a better approach to protection of, uh, of the, the data and privacy of the billions of users who use Facebook. So when I talk about anti-monopoly work and antitrust, it's really important for, for um, me to be clear that I see regulation, antitrust, and public investment as all being part and parcel of a larger program. So the language that I'll use today and that I uh, uh, have been using over the summer and, and plan to keep using is specifically a language about the reinvigoration of anti-monopoly policy. And that means to me the, the commitment to using public power, specifically government power, to rein in private power, specifically corporate power. And it, re it requires saying that corporations don't work for shareholders, they work for us. And it puts the primacy on government as the force to deliver on the promise of, uh, of the public good. There are three key pieces of anti-monopoly. The first is probably the most obvious, antitrust. This is where we talk about not just breakups, but also behavioral remedies, other kinds of structural reforms. The second is around regulation. This can be privacy regulation. It can, often, uh, it can also be uh, regulation around interoperability to spur competition, data mobility. Hopefully we'll get into some of these issues on the, on the panel today. Or it could be certificates of needs that healthcare providers need to have in order to open a new hospital. It's the role of regulation in creating competitive and fair markets. And then thirdly, I think it's important to not forget the role of public investment and specifically public options. In many, in, over the course of our history, when we talk about how to fight back uh, against the concentration of corporate power, one tool that has often been used is public investment to compete with private providers as yet another way of holding uh, those who have concentrated corporate power um, accountable. So uh, I, I'm very excited to get into more of the details on all of that, but I'll just uh, close my opening remarks by, by reinforcing um, the sense of momentum that this community has. I mean, just this week, we saw 50 state attorney generals, 50 state attorney generals open up an investigation into Google and Google's practices. In a time when our politics could not be more divided and you can barely get Republicans and Democrats to agree on anything, we have an astonishing consensus that corporations like Google, Facebook, and others have become too large, too powerful, and it's time to rein them in. And I hope this is, in the history of this movement, this is just the preface to, uh, to the first chapter and the continuing work of the next few years. Great, thank you. Um, so we're turning now to Florencia next because she's going to tell, <coughs> talk more about data. Yeah, so thank you so much, Eleanor, for putting this together. So my focus will be on the uh, data aspect of, of what these uh, giant uh, firms do. So th the first thing to keep, to keep in mind is that these uh, uh, firms like Google and Facebook and Amazon have conferred many benefits to consumers. In fact, much of the world uh, that, that we uh, experience today has been, uh, is a product of our interaction with these firms, how we search, how we shop, you know, how many of you bought your law school textbooks on Amazon? It didn't exist when I was in law school. It wasn't, it wasn't so long ago. Um, so, uh, and, 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 how we, and how we communicate with one another and how we define who a friend is. So there's lots of benefits, but one thing that to keep in mind, and this might have to do with the uh, size of the, of the firms and also the existing uh, regulatory structure that we live in, uh, we need to make sure that these benefits are not undermined by the potential harms, which we'll talk about um, a second. So as I said, these firms provide the lens through which we experience the world. And when it may appear that we have a choice 
in, in these particular, even within these platforms, I guess not so much across them because the platforms the, define the market in, in these ways. So the base, Facebook has basically swallowed up all, all, all other uh, social networks. Um, uh, when, when I was a 1L, I, I think it was MySpace, uh, what was the, the cool thing to have? Um, again, not dating myself at all. And um, so, so they provide the lens through which we experience um, the world, and, and it might appear that we, that we have a choice, um, but um, you know, we, we, we can, for example, it's true that when you type something into Google, there's pages and pages and pages of, of outcomes, and, and even though we know that these algorithms might, might actually be curated in a way that might benefit the firm, so Amazon got into trouble for uh, prioritizing its own products when, when you search for them, even though they might be better, uh, better suited or better priced products below, or the same is true with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Google's uh, search results or with, or, or, or with the way in which we experience the newsfeed, right? We can, we can scroll down, we can, we can, we can navigate these, uh, these uh, platforms, but turns out that extensive research uh, into uh, behavioral economics has unearthed a number of consumer biases that showed that even though it takes only a few seconds to just go further on the list of uh, uh, search results, we really don't do so. We don't search much, or we don't, we don't shop around much at all either. And, and even though we could change, or say, our privacy settings on Facebook, we don't do that. We suffer from deep-seated inertia. So what this means is that the architecture, the choice architecture that uh, these firms create are quite sticky and quite powerful. And why might this matter? Because what the, what the uh, results that these algorithms produced might not necessarily reflect what consumers uh, might prefer or, or might be in the, the best interest of consumers or, or general welfare. So that might be a problem. So there is choice, but the choice is not, uh, is not uh, exercise. exercise. So um, in addition, firms uh, want our attention, so there might also be some elements of wanting us to be stuck to our uh, phones or, 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 or looking at, uh, at, at, at the platforms continuously because, because that's what they, uh, that, that's what they uh, care about the most. And this is related to the most important component, which is data, right? So this is the most valuable uh, asset that these firms have, which is not only your attention, but information about you, about who you are, about how you shop, about whether you know how how you where where you, know, where you are, uh, with whom you interact. So the amounts of data that are collected about you are enormous. Not only that, the information is shared in different ways and combined. And consumers many times know very little about how this is uh, how this is done. Right. So every click, wake time, sleep time, whatever app there is that that does that uh, that uh, where, where you voluntarily give information, now there are all of this genetic testing sites. So your sibling might have given genetic information to uh, 23andMe, and now 23andMe knows everything about you. Um, and you gave no consent. So, um, so these companies are, are giant collectors and gatekeepers and sharers of this information. How do they communicate to consumers what is collected and what is done with this information? This is done through in, in privacy policies that are posted in hyperlinks at the end of the page. And sometimes you have to agree to them when you, when you sign up online. Now, how many of you have read an entire privacy policy? <laughs> All right. <laughs> These are lawyers. Lawyers. These are lawyers. Yes. That's amazing. So usually it's about uh, uh, one in 1,000. So, um, so, so, so you guys are doing great. <laughs> Way better than average. So this, this this is a law school crowd. So you know you, you get better. You get three and um, so um so so okay. So we have uh, firms having our attention. They have lots of our data. It's all revealed in fine print that we don't read. And um, and of course firms can do all sorts of things with this information. And um, and and they do. But but we don't know what that is. Now what is the model in the United States that that curbs or, or reins in some of what firms can do with these vast amounts of, of information. Um, and what, what this has, uh, the, the agency that uh, is in charge of this is the Federal Trade Commission. And the uh, Federal Trade Commission has created a model that has, called, that, that has been in operation for the past several decades, decades, and it's called Notice and Choice. And what it does is it, 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 it relies on, on two things. <laughs> 
on no disclosure, meaning that if firms reveal their information practices and their privacy policies, that consumers will read these, uh, these clear information practices and then shop around uh, and go to the sellers or, or to the vendors that might have the privacy practices that best match their preferences. But nobody reads. And of course, you have to be able to go to competing vendors. So notice and choice relies on two things, competition and consumer knowledge. Yet none of those two things are happening. So the model, as it, as it stands, it gives uh, firms free reign to do whatever, basically whatever they want with their information. So I guess it can get the five billion slap on the wrist. And, well, and, and what are the consequences of that? Right? So what are the potential harms that can happen? It's like, okay, great, I gave my information, and in exchange I get all of this free stuff. Well, it turns out there's lots of things, right? In addition to data breaches, um, and maybe sharing information with potential employers and, or insurers who might make decisions about us that we, uh, that we don't know about, or sometimes maybe the creep factor, right? That there's these companies that know so much about us and can make decisions about us, what we see and what we read. And the Cambridge Analytica is, is, a, is a wonderful uh, <clears throat> and terrifying illustration of, of what might happen when a firm has a lot of information about us and it shares it with people that, or individuals or entities that might have uh, motives that, that might hurt us or, or our democracy. And so, um, so we can talk more about the harms and, and the current regulatory structure in the discussion. Great, thank you. Ted, it's yours. All right, thank you, Eleanor. Um, I'd, I'd like to start out uh, with a word about uh, Eleanor herself. Uh, I, I uh, was aware of her way back when I was in school when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, she had already uh, established a pretty good reputation as an as a rising and extraordinarily talented antitrust uh, uh, litigator and counselor. And uh, let me just say that uh, she commands enormous respect, uh, not only in the academic world, but in the world of antitrust practitioners and antitrust enforcement agency officials. Uh, she's just done wonderful things for antitrust education and the field of antitrust itself. And I'm very honored that, that she invited me here, uh, and I'm extremely uh, pleased to appear. Now, uh, I'd like to provide just a little bit of background and context to the excellent issues that have been raised by the other panelists and I'm sure will be discussed. Um, this looks like a fairly young crowd, and I, I want to make sure you're aware that this is not the first time uh, that the whole question of government control of private power and monopoly power has been considered as a very, very major public policy issue. Uh, even though there are uh, a variety of new elements to the uh, big technology platforms and the issue they raise, there are a number of very useful generic precedents in our experience. Uh, first, the first wave uh, uh, when, when this occurred was in the mid to late 19th century at the very dawn of the industrial age when America was essentially an agrarian society and the first major industries emerged. And, and this concern is really what motivated uh, two major public policy approaches to the control of monopoly, and Chris mentioned both of them. The first is regulation. And in fact, regulation was the first chronologically that was tried by the U.S., the, by the federal government. And that is when the Interstate Commerce Act established an administrative agency to oversee all of the competitive conduct of the railroad industry. And this was later extended not only to all of the transportation industries, uh, the surface transportation industries like uh, trucks and uh, inland waterways and ocean shipping, but the model of ICC administrative regulation was also extended to virtually every other major fundamental industrial sector in the United States, and that would include air transportation, it would include uh, telecommunications and uh, cable TV and radio and so forth, all along the same administrative model. The second fundamental approach, of course, is antitrust. 
my main point is that, and of course the Sherman Act was passed in 1890, so both of these modes of public control of business power have been around for a long time. Let me tell you some of the lessons learned. Uh, on the administrative side, uh, this, is, this, this is an interesting tale to tell. You'll notice, uh, if you're aware, that the Interstate Commerce Commission established in 1887 no longer exists. And the Civil Aeronautics Board, which regulated air transportation, no longer exists. And the reasons for that are, 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 are basic and very sound. Administrative and bureaucratic control of business conduct and the administrative agency structure itself is known to suffer from a variety of basic weaknesses, uh, including uh, lack of clarity in mandate, political interference, lack of accountability, uh, incapacity to recognize change circumstances and reform from within, um, uh, regulatory capture, and sometimes even corruption in what I think you'd regard as a classical sense, people paying money for certain rulings or for certain legislation involving regu regulatory systems. So in recognition of those problems, that's why we don't have an Interstate Commerce Commission anymore. That's why we don't have a Civil Aeronautics Board anymore. That's why energy regulation, which once extended to virtually all parts of the energy sector, is now confined to limited sectors such as long distance high voltage electricity transmission, which is still regulated according to a kind of public utility model, but for many other phases of the industry like uh, uh, electric generation, uh, they're, uh, they're managed by the use of competition subject to antitrust. Now, antitrust, uh, although I have great love and respect for it, also has some issues with it. Again, demonstrated with a century, over a century of experience. And those issues are nowhere more significant than in this very, this very specific area we're talking about today, which is antitrust control of large firm or monopoly conduct, which is what you're talking about. When you talk about the behavior of a single firm, collusion with other firms, that's a much easier issue. Mergers with other firms, that's, that's in my opinion, uh, not, as, not quite as easy as cartels, but easier than control of monopoly conduct because the instances of true success in that role for antitrust, the, the record is very, very mixed. There are many, many examples of attempts by the government that you start out with the kind of youthful enthusiasm that, that Chris demonstrates so beautifully that there's a problem that needs to be solved. But when you bog down in the actual process of litigation, the actual need to come up with specific injunctive remedies and for the courts or the agencies to actually administer those remedies, it's a lot harder than it sounds at the launch. And in fact, it entangles the courts and the antitrust agencies in many of the same complications that beset the administrative, the now extinct administrative agencies that I referred to earlier. Now, uh, for example, uh, there, were, there was a whole slew of efforts uh, in the 1960s and 70s to do exactly what Chris is suggesting, although in slightly different industrial sectors. The United States, on the last day of Lyndon Johnson's administration, brought a massive antitrust case, monopolization case against IBM. After 13 years of discovery and trial and so on, it was basically dismissed as being without merit. And in that 13-year period, IBM had transitioned from a company perceived to be 
unconquerable and aggressive and, and uncontrollable, uh, perhaps in ways similar uh, to the way that uh, Amazon and Facebook and Google are perceived. But during the course of that proceeding, IBM had faded to a shadow. And, and now, even though IBM is a multi-billion dollar industry, it is, it is essentially not even a part of the dialogue, not, not part of GAFA or even anywhere close to that, to that group. So with the sobriety that comes from specific investigation and, and encountering all the, all the specific details that have to be mastered in bringing a big technology company to heel, these, these cases characteristically fail. And the same could be said of the uh, FTC's effort to break up the integrated oil companies in the 1970s, the Inray Exxon case. There was an effort to break up the breakfast cereal industry, uh, Inray Kellogg, dismissed in the 1980s because the whole thing had become more or less self-evidently futile. And it didn't hurt that in the defense of these cases that during the 60s and 70s, the American economy transitioned from uh, an economy that relied minimally on ex ex uh, exports and imports. And all of a sudden, we had big challenges as the world trading system grew and as international competition became more of a reality. We had competitors in Germany and Japan and other offshore places that were regarded as serious competitive threats. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't try. I'm not saying the issue makes no sense. What I am saying is that history has a number of well-established lessons for caution. So I want to just close this, this part by referring to a divestiture, a, a breakup case against what was then the largest private enterprise that had existed in history, and it was successful, and it spectacularly succeeded, in my opinion, and that is the breakup of the former Bell system. It, I, I, you know, it's probably very difficult to explain uh, to an audience that, where I, I, I would gather everybody in here is carrying at least one uh, smartphone. <laughs> But there was a day when all you had was a little black dial telephone, and whatever you did with that little black dial telephone uh, was under the control of the old Bell system, the former AT&T. And they did everything. They did the equipment. They did the uh, long distance and the short distance. So you name it, AT&T was the monopoly. You could turn no place else. And the old Bell system's idea of innovation was the princess phone. Who in here knows what a princess phone is? Well, basically it was a little black telephone, only it was shaped like an oval, and you could get it in colors. That was the major innovation. And so, uh, I'm not saying impossible, I'm saying though, reasons to be very, very cautious and to insist on uh, very specific, uh, uh, targeted things to do about the problems that we see with big tech. So thank you all. Um, uh, Tad, you have laid out a very, a very serious line of thinking, uh, which is in the United States under our monopoly law, it's section two of the Sherman Act, you have to give arguments to all of the points Tad made. Industries change, firms change, the antitrust regulation isn't always successful, it isn't always good. Let's just take that as one end of a continuum. And let's move to another end. And at the other end, we have, we think we see problems. At least so many people in like all levels of public policy, um, the, the state's attorney generals, the federal government, Europe, Europe, Europe. Um, there, are there new problems? Are there new kinds of power? Um, can our laws control it? Should it be controlled? And can our laws control it? I think to understand that, you have to break things down. So we've now had a framework. And to break them down, we should think of particular circumstances. Like, I know Chris is doing a lot of work on Facebook and its 
killer acquisitions, right, Chris? Uh, where Facebook has had a program to snap up all of the startups that it detected and predicted from all the data it had um, would be competitors to it if it let them live and survive. Um, so that's one point. Should we be thinking more seriously about all of these acquisitions and the spin-offs of the acquisitions from Facebook? Let's stay with that one problem for a minute because there are other problems. The problems are different. Google's problems are different. Apple's problems are different. Amazon's problems are different. Um, what should we do about killer acquisitions? Um, Chris, do you want to? Sure. Chime well, in? I'm I'm um, happy happy to chime in on that specifically. Um, in order to do that, I feel like I have to tell a slightly different story of the economy <laughs> than uh, Tad does and the story of antitrust. I'll land there, I promise. Um, unsurprisingly, I uh, believe in a very different story of what has happened in our economy. I think that if you look at what's happened in the, uh, the uh, decades since the Second World War, we had a period of immense historic economic growth, record unemployment, incredible innovation, productivity rates that had never been seen before in all of human history. And this period happened to overlap with a period of, in, of, of uh, investment in antitrust enforcement. And I don't think that's a, con, uh, a coincidence. It's not just that antitrust was part of it. It was about a broader view, again, that markets don't exist in any free state. That's not a, a reality anywhere in history, and instead, you always have the state creating certain terms of the debate, property rights, regulation of the monetary supply, contracts, antitrust and, and competition laws. We could, go through, we could go through a long list. And so in that period, we saw a very significant rise and even flowering of antitrust law. And then in the 70s and 80s, there was a very specific movement by Bork and others to narrow the purview of antitrust law so that people like Tad could sit up here today and tell you that antitrust law often doesn't work. Because they took a whole body of law, which was much more, uh, much more aggressive, and I feel a little bit out of my lane because El Eleanor is the, the expert, expert here, oh, and, right. and took it to a very oh, narrow right. view in a way that the courts consistently said that we can't uphold these things. So I look back at something like the IBM story from 1968 onward, and where I think Tad sees a, a failure of antitrust policy because IBM ended up as a a mid-sized company that you know is still worth tens of billions. I don't know exactly what the market cap is. And I see that as a success. Antitrust law brought a suit against a company that it seems like was uh, illegally uh, using its power and size. And over the course of the, those 13 years, there was a policeman at the elbow. It's a phrase that my friend uh, Tim Wu uses that kept IBM in check. And over time, it got right-sized as a company. It still stayed innovative, still stayed competitive. Now a full 50 years later, still, still, still out there. But it isn't as large as Facebook. It isn't as large as Google. And it is you know, the, the kind of company that I don't I'm not aware of any antitrust scholars making a, a complaint about IBM today. That, to me, even though the case ended up with a dismissal, can be considered a kind of, of mitigated success. So I'll, I'll land specifically with Facebook. You know, in the, I left Facebook in 2007. We started Facebook in 2004. And the period that all of the investigations are about today comes much later, from 2011, 12, 13, 14, um, around the acquisitions of WhatsApp and around the acquisitions of Instagram. So I don't have firsthand knowledge of a lot of, of, um, of what happens there. So in some ways, I'm, I'm playing the role of, of analyst. I mean, a unique perspective because of my role in the, in the early days. But it was, um, to me and to a lot of other folks in Silicon Valley, when Facebook bought Instagram, it seemed like, well, this is just what companies do. They buy competitors that are trying to get in on their product in order to er either eradicate or shut them down or freeze the marketplace so that you own all of photo sharing. That's just like how the market works, right? No. 
Historically, that has been illegal. Facebook pursued a strategy of acquisitions with Instagram, WhatsApp, and others that was in pro uh, 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 broad daylight, and in so doing, froze the marketplace, stopped competition, and what you've seen is that we haven't had a single major social network be created in nearly nine years at this point. And so I think we are relearning the fact that these kinds of behaviors are illegal, that they have been prosecuted over the course of decades in our country's history, and that it's just in the past 40 years, as a result of a concerted movement of scholars, activists, and some lawyers, that we have lost the language to even discuss this. And so that's why I think Facebook in yes. particular is, a, is, a, is an important case and a turning point moment. Right, and everything you said can lead in direction of do we need new tools, because the law actually has gotten pretty conservative and it's hard to win these cases. So, uh, so one, th there, Maybe two kinds of conduct I want to raise, and, and data I want to raise separately, and bigness I want to raise separately, uh, that if, to the extent we have time, and we don't have much time because we want to turn to you soon, but one point is, um, should those past acquisitions be divested? Another is on the conduct, the gatekeeper problem, you know, Google is the gatekeeper and it competes with those on its platform. Does it have duties of fair dealing? Uh, we see conduct that uh, the gatekeepers, not just Google, but all of them, uh, they take advantage of the fact they have data on their, uh, all of their competitors that are on their platform. They have extreme amounts of data. They can tell when their competitors are getting very good and have very good ideas, and they usually steal them. They appropriate them. Um, so those are two kinds of conduct different, the, the um, abuse of the platform, abuse of gatekeeper, and mergers of snapping up all the competitors. And the data problem, which is in uh, Florencia's field, is probably more regulatory. Antitrust is more opening the markets. There might be things that competition can do to get rid of the restrictions that close the market and let the market work. Regulation, like privacy regulation, it's more about there are rules that must be enacted to tell companies what they must do in terms of information about what they're taking from you when they take the data. And then the last point is bigness as such. And, and Chris, you've reflected a few times on are these companies just too big? If they are, what tools do we have? And then Tad has reflected on that too, at least by implication, I'd say to say no. <laughs> So who wants, who wants to intervene now and on any of those points, because we don't have time on all of those points, uh, so, so I'd say our conversation should not be more than a couple of minutes before we turn to you. I can say something brief about data and competition. So, so open, creating a more competitive market will foster more innovation, will, ad, will ameliorate some of the problems that, that we've uh, evaluated. So this idea of, of, of squishing the competitors or, or, or creating uh, uh, suboptimal uh, products for uh, consumers because uh, advertisers might get, might get squished out. But that does not necessarily mean that it will address all of the problems. So take privacy, right? Take the gathering the vast amount of information. So one way for competition to take care of the problem, what is the problem? The problem is that the, what firms are doing with their information or the amount of information that firms are collecting might not be consistent with our preferences when we sit down and figure out what those preferences are, because it's not, it's not easy to, to figure out what those are in the context of privacy. The, the, the way in which competition ameliorates those problems is if firms start competing on this dimension. So uh, Microsoft tried. They had a bunch of commercials trying to say that they had better privacy than other firms. Like That didn't go much. Uh, uh, that didn't go uh, uh, anywhere. And the reason why that is is that for, an ask, for, for, for a feature to be, uh, to be uh, subject to competition, it has to be salient, right? It has to be something that consumers are thinking about how heavy your phone is, how fast the processor speed is, and apparently, more than anything, how great is your camera, right? So these features can, are subject to competition. So we have all of the mobile platforms competing over now the new iPhone, I don't know how many uh, uh, cameras it has. And, um, 
And, and that's great, but when was the last time you saw a firm competing on privacy or firms competing on arbitration? You can sue us anywhere. It's not a great slogan. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so if, if an element is not salient, such as privacy, be it because it's difficult to make those choices, we have information avoidance, we all care about our retirement plans, but we don't want to be thinking about our 401k all the time, right? So card questions, we just want to avoid and put to the side. And information privacy is one of them, mostly because we get so much stuff for free. But that doesn't mean that we don't care about them. So for those aspects of uh, features of products and, and, and services that are not salient, competition might not work. So we might need to rethink our regulatory structure, which right now relies on competition and, and puts so much burdens on consumers, so many burdens on consumers. We have to read everything and compare. Um, so maybe a model like the, uh, what the uh, EU is doing with uh, the GDPR is not perfect, but, but is better, right? Because it puts the, the, uh, the onus on firms. They have to do better instead of us. We don't have to read everything and, and compare and, and shop around. We can maybe sit back and, and, mm -hmm. and, and maybe uh, feel safe or with an asterisk, uh, better uh, that firms might be uh, using or collecting only the information that is relevant for the purposes of, of conducting their particular business with you. But we can talk more about that. Great. So if you want one minute now, Pat, that's all you get. I, could, could I see a show of hands of who, who wants to talk, say something, um, question or comment? I, there are a few. There's, I wanted to get a sense. So I see there are a few, and they're going to be Microsoft microphones that will come around in a minute. One minute, Pat, and then we'll go to the audience. OK, just, just two points very quickly. Uh, uh, Chris, I really appreciated your, your kind of very skillful reinterpretation of the history. Uh, and I, I would just wanted to say that, <laughs> that, the, that, the aggressive, that, that the aggressive antitrust enforcement you referred to, I think, I think it was fine up to a point. But there was this unfortunate period that culminated in the year 1972 when through the connivance of the agencies and the courts, Almost every competitive practice was declared to be automatically illegal, by which I mean, you, you know, you, if you were the defendant in an antitrust case, you essentially didn't get a trial on the merits because the, the, the point was for vertical restraints, patent licensing restrictions, all kinds of competitive strategies that I, I think that you might agree with me are totally innocent, the rule was, if you did it, it was illegal, and we're going to go right to calculating damages. So that's point one. Point. Yeah. Am I out of time? Yeah, you're out of time. Okay. 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but I was okay. going to cite Kobe versus Dempsey Pump on the acquisition issue, which is not a bad one. No, not a bad one. But <laughs> okay. I except that, save it for your closing okay. if you want to. Oh, oh, that's a great. Uh, idea. Yeah, because you each have you each have two minutes for closing. Um, and we have questions here and here. Does somebody have a microphone? Michael, do you? Uh, somebody is bringing the microphone. So there's one here, the second one over here. And there are definitely more. I think we should take all of your questions, like if there are three or four, because um, time is going to run out too soon. Or at least we'll take three to begin with. So there's been a lot of talk about um, data as a privacy concern with the consumer and the firm. I'm also wondering if your thoughts on data, data as a commodity, so the firms that own the most data have more market power um, now, and also as we move into more AI type of things, the firms with more data are going to essentially have more ability to move faster in those markets. I'm wondering if that could be a, a, more of an antitrust issue than sort of the way we're viewing data as a privacy concern today. Um. You might have to fill me in because I couldn't hear that. But um, can uh, Florencia, was that to you? Uh, oh, maybe, maybe uh, if it was. Oh, I, th specific. I thought we were going to take three I, questions. Yeah, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I, we have who has the microphone? This one over here. I, I didn't hear. I can them. answer that. She to. she was asking if the um, the large data sets and the advances in AI give um, or, or introduce any new complexities into mm -hmm. antitrust law or privacy regulation. Yeah, yeah. I I, th I think they do. Right? So uh, firms that collect 
a vast amounts of, of information can, can for the, for the, in terms of how it affect uh, competition, they can, they can better able predict ways to keep, the, keep you within the platform much more effectively than other firms that never even get to have a bite at, at your Apple. Uh, just because they just get they get effectively uh, shut down. So yes, I think there's a very strong relationship between the amount of data that gets amassed and and the uh, the, assert, the the uh, way in which firms can uh, assert monopoly power. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question kind of relates to the size and power that these companies have been able to acquire. Um, so f Mark Zuckerberg recently announced that Facebook's going to be creating what he's called the Supreme Court of Facebook, which would be an independent body to adjudicate on kind of flagged content. At the same time, they have Facebook sending delegations of their privacy lawyers to meet with um, particular ambassadors whose only portfolio is to meet with other technology companies. Um, so the scholarship's treating this as if they're states. I'm wondering if that's um, useful in terms of the way that we should approach breaking them up. Should we think about these as kind of between a sovereign state and a company, or is it more useful to try to relegate them to the company status in terms of regulation? Um, yeah, would, that, would one of you want to answer that right now? Because I also had a hard time. Sure, I, I, I think they're companies. Yeah. Mark Zuckerberg is a CEO and um, not, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think that, you know, Facebook is in a difficult position because they've got two billion people sharing all kinds of information, obviously, on the platform. But I think that um, when it comes to what speech people can be, um, share on it, I think those are fundamentally First Amendment questions. They're free speech questions, and those should be decided in the courts, not by, a, you know, a roundtable of folks that Mark Zuckerberg and other CEOs pick. I mean, I, I feel like the, the, the law exists for a reason. Now, we'd still need some kind of, of framework, and it may be developed through case law. It could be de developed through legislation for what counts or what doesn't. And it butts up against a lot of the questions around Section 230, which is the part of the 1996 law that uh, causes the, the tech platforms to not have liability for the information that's shared on it. So I think we need a big legal conversation, uh, social and uh, political and legal conversation about it. But I think it's very clear to me that um, these companies are companies. They are not states. They do not have that legal power. Now, when you're a monopoly and you, you own the only social networks that are out there, effectively, when you say you can't say X, but you can say Y, it looks sometimes like it's all state-like power, but let's not be confused. It's not. It's just a function of the power they have by being so concentrated. Hi. It seems that um, one of the things I keep thinking about in trying to fight these sorts of like big tech companies is that they do have this vast amount of wealth. And that's always difficult to get around, especially when you're trying to enact regulations. Regulations are made by legislators and they're influenced by money in one way or another. Um, and it seems that one of the ways that you can try and get around that is by trying to get the people more involved, even like just regular everyday people to try and get them more involved. But many of you have mentioned that it's people we don't care to search even through to the bottom of a Google search page. So what sort of efforts do you think can be done to try and get the public more on this action and to care more about these issues? You know, like security isn't something that's like particularly sexy to think about for just your every per everyday person, but it is important. And how can you how can you get people to care so that the influence of money can be um, tempered a bit by public, public action? It seems like it's made for you, Chris. Um, well, I'm curious what, and, I'm and curious what others... I mean, I thought yeah, I'm curious what others think. I think that this is, I think this is the problem, I mean, not to be too dramatic about it, but the problem not just in tech and antitrust, but the problem for our collective generation. Right, because we are coming of age in a time when um, a lot of folks have done everything they can to destroy Americans' faith in government. You know, we have regulatory infrastructure that in many cases works pretty well. You think about the FDA, the FAA at times, you think about um, the EPA, 
And you think about what this administration, just as an example, is trying to do, not only to, dis to, to, to um, reduce the CFPB, to reduce the power of these regulatory bodies, but to, to, to have Americans think that they have to give up on government. Like, that's the, the play, right, is to just have this cynicism be so permeating that when we face big problems, we have to, what are we going to do about it? we got to create an app, you know, which, okay, maybe sometimes, but let's not forget that, that a public power has a very unique and important role to play. So I think that um, the, the challenge is significant because it's a two-step process. We have to make the case for antitrust law, for regulation, and we can say for government, writ large, at the same time as acknowledging that certain institutions of government, like the FTC and others, have been, if not entirely captured, at least partially captured, by industry because they have been under assault now for decades. So we have to make the case for something that is at a historically weak point. Um, so that is not going to be something that we solve in the next year or two, but I think, I, I hope that our generation is the generation to do that and, and to do that in a way that speaks to antitrust, climate change, a whole set of issues um, over the coming years and decades. I'd like to point out to a silver lining to all of this. Um, look at the size of this crowd, right? So a lot of people are interested in this issue. If you, if you look, at, if you, if you look at, the, at the front pages of the top newspapers for the last decade, privacy and big tech have been prominently featured. So this is something that is slowly, as difficult and complex as it is, slowly seeping into our um, more uh, the, the aware part of our, of our consciousness. And this is a good thing, because then we're going to start demanding uh, better things. Maybe we won't search to the bottom of our, uh, of our, of our uh, Google search or, or change our architecture so much, but maybe we'll change a little bit, or sometimes we'll check something, or sometimes we'll, we'll demand other things. I mean, ever since I started studying privacy, I've become much more, I don't want to say paranoid, because I said this was a positive thing, but aware um, of the choices that I've had, and I've exercised them. I don't know to, to, what, uh, to the benefit of what, but, but I have, and it feels kind of good. Um, with my limited amount of, of, uh, of control. But, but maybe the more we do it, and, and the more it becomes salient, uh, the more uh, we, we can make changes together with whatever regulatory uh, tools that might be necessary to rein in all of these market failures and other problems. Two seconds. Yeah, I, I just want to say there are uh, public responses to this kind of problem. You know, back in the days when there was tremendous concern about the safety and quality of consumer products, an economics professor at Amherst College by the name of Colston Warren said, well, objective consumer information is the answer to this. And that was the, found, he, he became the founder of Consumers Union, which is the publisher of Consumer Reports, which is still one of the great places to go. And, and you know, it seems to me if you were searching for hacks on how to cut through the the, the ad clutter on Google or, or some other platform, uh, you might very well find something useful. Uh, and and I, I, I think I need to say something in the defense of the FTC. I realize I trashed their Exxon case pretty badly. The, the FTC is the repository of tremendous institutional knowledge and expertise on, on this kind of issue. And if uh, if there are additional powers to be, regulatory powers to be given, and we may need to in the, in the area of privacy and consumer data, uh, I would say the FTC is the, is the first place to look. They've done some tremendously good things over the years. The do not call registry um, uh, and, you know, there, there are a number of other uh, major efforts that could be cited. Right. So consciousness is a very good point that all of you have made. Awareness makes me think also of Ralph Nader many years ago because that was a period of time when cars were so unsafe and he wrote this book, Unsafe at Any Speed, and people weren't conscious of it until he wrote this and it led to all sorts of revolutions. So things like what Chris is doing is leading to all sorts of revolutions that we're more conscious of and have to be conscious of what's happening with big data and its power. So each of the panelists, you have only one minute to oh close. <laughs> um, oh my because God. Because we must end at two, and that is five of two. So, um, 
Shall we run down? Uh, Florence, you said yeah, we'll run down. Less than, than one minute. So uh, I think we've, we've, uh, there's lots to talk about, but what's clear is that um, uh, monopoly is, is a problem and that market failures do exist, and, and they're very likely uh, when you have all of the ingredients that are present uh, in, in the context of, of, of big tech and, and these consumer uh, platforms. So thinking about the appropriate regulation is important. I'm, I'm not a pessimist of, of, of uh, regulation at all. Yes, they have all the, all the problems that they have, but we've also seen uh, regulations worked extremely well. And, and, I, and, I, and I am a believer that, that they can if we only, if we only empower our, our agencies with, with, a, with a little bit more. And, and that is the subject of another forum that hopefully we'll have another time. Uh, but but I, I do think that there is a problem and that, and that there needs to be a, 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 that something needs to be done about it. Okay, well, my view, I'm, I'm not saying never, <laughs> I would never say never, but there are very sound reasons for skepticism of any regulatory solution. What's essential is to be very specific about identifying the problem. I mean, even for regulation, I'm glad Chris mentioned the Federal Aviation Administration. We will always need regulation of airline and, and aircraft safety. And uh, it's just a question of trying to make it as good as possible. But would we throw out, we say, let's not have air traffic control, let's not have regulation of, uh, of new airplanes because there are just all these problems with regulatory agencies. Well, that, that's not an answer. So even in the antitrust sphere, uh, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, cr uh, we've talked about this, uh, you know, buying up rivals. There is precedent for antitrust challenges of this pattern of, buying up rivals, and, and uh, it's an old precedent, it's, but it's never been overruled or, or really discredited in any great degree, and one will find models for the kind of relief that I think Chris is talking about in, in the existing law on monopolization. So it's just a question of you know, getting somebody to you know, look, look very carefully through the cases in the law books. So I wanted to end on an optimistic note, and I was going to say one thing, but then I'm, um, I'm even more optimistic now because we have a George Mason law professor arguing for more regulation, or at least some regulation, which uh, I don't know if we would have heard a couple of years ago. Um, I, I am really optimistic because um, uh, essentially every single branch of government that could be providing oversight uh, to big tech is now quite literally on the case. State attorney generals... The House of Representatives has a subcommittee that's opened an investigation. Several folks on the Senate committee have announced. The FTC has an investigation into Facebook. The Department of Justice has an investigation into all of the tech companies. Everyone is paying attention, so we should be optimistic, but there is a lot of work to do, specifically in defining the harms. It's not just the privacy stuff that we've focused on on this panel. It's the lack of innovation, the uh, uh, decline in entrepreneurship uh, rates. There are many problems here that we could have a whole other uh, conversation to inventory, but there is momentum here, and now it's our job to make sure that the momentum doesn't fizzle, but uh, you know, uh, leads to, to real results in the months and years to come. Okay, that's a good note to close on. There are new problems. We have to think about them. You as budding lawyers also have to think exactly, as Tad said, exactly what is the problem, exactly what is the remedy for the problem, but we shouldn't forget that there are new problems arising and they may need new solutions and they are on the table right now all over the United States and the world and here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.